This program is made possible in part by Cerisi Conlon, LLP. Protecting the future and using the law as a force for good in both the courtroom and our communities. Online at CeriseConlon.com. And welcome. Every year for the last oh, 13, 14 years, I've had the privilege and the honor to sit with the Minnesota Teacher of the Year and ply them with questions. And I'm with now the 2023 hot off the press winner <laughs> of this year's great award. Mike Houston is my guest. I know a lot of you have read about him, uh, heard about him. He is a math teacher teaching ninth through 12th graders, yes. um, many different classes at Harding High School. And you've been at that school, Mike, years. 18 years. 18. 19. 19. 19. It's going up. Sure changed me that one. Yep. 19, <laughs> 19 years. 19 years. Um, yeah, that's a long run at mm. one school. Yep. And obviously, you haven't burned out. Not yet. <laughs> which I know is something a lot of teachers are are faced and yes, facing. Especially since the pandemic, yes. I know, the pandemic. Um, I want to ask you about that in a minute. But I wanted to just go back with you, what, a week and a half or two weeks to when you were at the banquet <clears throat> and you heard your name announced. Can you just share what that was like for you when you heard your name? It was an incredulous feeling for me because it was totally unexpected. Honestly, I all the other finalists were qualified and I, I keep, I have to pinch my, I, there's a video of me pinching myself because uh. I just did not believe that my name was called. Um, but it's something that I, I am privileged to, to have this honor, it's, it was, it's good for our community. We've gone through a lot the last couple of years, good for our students and our staff. So I, I, I welcome. Well, congratulations in a Thank you. official way here. Um, I've read, had the, the chance to read his resume and uh, it's so impressive and I wanna pull some things from it to share with you too. But um, when you say your community has gone through a lot, you mean the Harding High School school system, right? Yes. Um, yeah. I know I've read some things that were really uh, hard to so to deal with. I'm sure some shootings and yeah. Uh, since the pandemic, over the past couple of years, it's been a struggle for our students to kind of get back to normal school activities. Mm -hmm. They've gone through a lot, social and emotionally. This year specifically, we lost a student um, who took its own life. That's We've right. had a colleague pass away suddenly, and then mm -hmm. we had a fatal stabbing in our building as well. And that was in the building, wasn't it, Chad? No, it, it's coming back. Um, yeah, that's a lot for one school on top of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I've been aware that I think educators and leaders and the general public, we're all realizing now more than we even did during the pandemic, what a hit that was on our young people's health. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like there's a delayed awareness or recognition of that. Yeah, I mean, everyone wasn't able, everyone's experiences through the pandemic was different. I know for me, um, it hurt because 
especially that first month of the pandemic where you couldn't go anywhere. I know, you could we only were go, scared we, to death. We were locked in. Uh -huh. We could only go to the grocery stores and back home. So for me, that just left me with a lot of anxiety because I like to go to the gym. I like to play yeah. golf, I like to do things. And gyms were closed, golf courses weren't open. So that, that, that was a struggle for me. And trying to teach also yeah. through uh, through the camera and was, was a way very you've tough. never taught before no had you? I, I have never incorporated much technology into my classroom oh, but the pandemic really forced me to do that yeah um, and do it while you're teaching I mean learning on the job we were literally. learning on the fly yeah, yeah we, on the fly everything closed down uh, first or second week of March in 2020 right. and we had to have a digital presence for the rest of the school year yeah, it, it was a crazy and it almost feels like a bad dream period, doesn't it? It's sort of a blur. It does. I mean, these past three years have been really, I mean, it's just gone by really fast. Uh -huh. it's, it's hard to think that the pandemic, you know, the start of it was three years ago, but I mean, it's still impacting us today. Yeah, it sure is. And so, as you said, these other tragedies and losses on top of that it's a lot for a school but now they've got something to celebrate with with this honor it's, um, yeah and I, I told my other colleague Molly Keenan who was also a finalist yeah, another that, finalist from your same school from that's, the same school that this was our award that this uh -huh. was our entire community's award because we've had we've been dealing with a lot of negative press over the last couple of years I read, Mike, that your mother was um, a woman who hadn't gone to college, and you're the first person in your family that went to college. Yes. Is she still alive? Did she get to know about this honor? Yes. My mom, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, originally. Okay. And so I wanted my family to come out. They couldn't make it. My sister had a health scare, so mm -hmm. uh, they couldn't attend. But as soon as I learned that I won, I called them immediately uh -huh. to share the news and she couldn't be much more happier than I, I can just imagine the pride she must feel, you know? <laughs> yeah, she said, congratulations, baby. That's my baby. And oh, <laughs> so, oh so, that's my baby. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so exciting for the whole family. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's trailblazer it's phenomenal. here. Well, you went to high school at Tartan? No, no, I'm from. I went to high school in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, you went there. Okay. Yeah. Then how did you get to Minnesota to go to Concordia? So, when I finished high school, I finished with a 1.67 GPA. So I, okay. I school wasn't my focus. You weren't expecting a scholarship. I wasn't expecting a scholarship. Uh -huh. Sports was my focus. That's all I wanted to do in school. Okay. And then two of my best friends, I got full ride scholarship to play football at Division One schools, and we were really close. We hung out all the time. We played sports together, and so when they, uh, when I knew they were going to leave, it, it really forced me to look inside myself and decide my next steps. And so from there, I decided to go to a community college in Columbus. Uh -huh. And so I used that time to really brush up on the basic skills, learning how to write, read, mm -hmm. and really get my grades up. And then I, my desire was to go and try to walk on at a Division I oh. uh, school. And so I decided the University of Minnesota uh, as a school to, to try to walk on and, and make the team, and I did. Uh -huh. So I moved here with just the clothes I had in my closet, was able to get an apartment. A leap of faith, kind a of, A right? leap of faith, and uh -huh. it worked out. So I attended the University of Minnesota for a couple of years. I was uh, on the team uh, the second year uh, of uh, my University of Minnesota tenure. And that was a challenge because I was a walk-on athlete. So walk-on right. athletes don't get scholarships. They're just, you know, part of the team. You can earn your way to a scholarship. But, you know, moving up right. here, right. I had you to pay. Not knowing. Correct. I had to pay non um, um, uh, tuition fees. Right. I had to pay the non-resident fees. Right. I had to work, still, you know, pay for my, my apartment. Mm -hmm. I had to stay on top of my studies. And then I had to go to practice, and all that was really overwhelming. That's a lot to do as a, a transfer in 
to the U. Yeah, so yes. naturally my grade suffered uh, because of that and I was on academic proba probation and really close to flunking out of the U of M. So at that point, I made another decision that, okay, you know, pro football is not going to be my future. At this, I'm just too small. I'm not as big as those Division One guys are. So I decided that, you know, I need to go to a much smaller school. And so I decided on Concordia. Okay. So you graduated from Concordia. I did. Then you went right on to get your master's? No. I, so I taught for a few years. I oh, started okay. uh, in 0405 at Harding High School. And I started my master's program in about 2009. Oh, okay. I wasn't looking at dates carefully enough here. Um, but you got your master's and then um, even did some more postgraduate work, didn't you? I did. So our school has concurrent enrollment, so that allows colleges uh, or allows us to teach college courses in our high school. And so in order to do that, you have to have 18 graduate math credits. Mm -hmm. And also I teach part-time as an adjunct professor at my alma mater, Concordia. You're so doing I needed, that now, aren't I you? I am doing that now. Right. So in order to do those things, I needed to get the 18 graduate credits. Oh, I see. Okay, that all fits together. Um, not being a math person myself, I was really wanting to know what made you, and just in a nutshell, I guess, what made you choose math? Were you just um, a natural with math, or what was I your I wouldn't motivation? say I was a natural. Really, when I grew up in Columbus, we lived in a pretty sketchy neighborhood, and so with my mother and my grandparents. So. I, we wasn't really allowed, my sister and I wasn't really allowed to go outside often mm -hmm. just because of the area that we stayed in. So it's in. really a tough... So, so, uh -huh. so it was a, yeah, it was a tough neighborhood, so my mother and my grandparents often bought me like math puzzle games, math computer uh -huh. games to keep us occupied, and uh -huh. so that developed my love with mathematics, just uh -huh. being able to do those puzzle type oh, things, and yeah. Isn't it fascinating in a way to see what decisions that families make, you know, throughout life, sort of change the channel one goes. Down. Yes, my mother and my sister aren't mathematically inclined at all. Okay. So for me to, to have this passion for the subject, yeah. yeah, it all started with those little puzzles that kept me occupied. Oh, that's so cool to hear. Um, he teaches geometry, algebra, pre-calculus. I have taught those, And you yep. also teach teachers at Concordia. I do. Um, how to teach math. So I mean, you're really the math guy, aren't you? Yes, I am really embedded <laughs> in the subject. <laughs> you're the chair of the department at Harding. I am. And you've been that for quite a while. Yeah, I want to say 12 years now. Something like, yeah, yeah. You, 12 years. That's a long time to be chairman. <laughs> and you also are doing some really interesting things like with the math team. Um, I read that you've developed, um, or the kids and you have developed a, a course where you look at real life events mm -hmm. and merge math with restorative justice, things like um, income inequity, et cetera. Yeah, so part of the pandemic, um, I was able to kind of look back at my practice and see what I could do to just help our kids to take something out of the classroom that they can actually use out in the real world. And that this time too, we had the George Floyd incident. Yeah. Um, so I was doing a curriculum writing for the district. And in that we were trying to combine social justice and personal finance into a curriculum to bring it back into our classrooms. And so, with that, I was able to develop a lot of things for Algebra 2 to incorporate a lot of the social justice and personal finance for when we uh, came back into the classroom. So yeah, a lot of things that um, I incorporated included the first unit that I did was taxes. So all the students mm -hmm. learn how to fill out a tax form, a 1040. That's just so, so uh, good sounding because, you know, most of us struggle with it mightily when we have it on our, our to-do list. Absolutely, and mm -hmm. so I wanted them to be exposed to doing their own taxes. Uh, will they remember it? 
maybe, maybe not, but at least they were exposed to it and they can say that, yep, right. I know what it's a dependent a is. They know. Thing here. Correct. Yeah. And then another unit that I did was about retirement. Mm. And so talked to them about pensions, 401k, social mm -hmm. security, and saving money and using a lot of the Algebra 2 concepts uh, with sequences to use that to predict, you know. So uh, really practical. Practical kind applications. Of, um, use of math. Yes. That sounds like it would much more likely grab even people like me who aren't, <laughs> aren't so inclined to, to think right. math. Right, and just gives the math context. Right, right, context. Mm -hmm. That's a good word for it. Um, as a teacher in a school that's got some tough things going on, what's the discipline situation like for you in your classes? Because a lot of teachers tell me, ooh, it's really tough right now. Personally, for me, over the past couple of years, I haven't had much discipline issues. And I think that just comes with me being real with them and, and being vulnerable mm. and, and, and showing them and being affectionate and showing them you know, love each and every day. Um, well, that, that would endear you to them, wouldn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. they'd see you as a, a real person. And yeah, again, especially coming back from the pandemic, I mean, our kids just dealt with so much trauma, whether it was a family member getting laid off or, yeah. you know, a family or member die. dying yeah. because of the, uh, of the COVID. So, yeah, when I came back, I just said, I'm just going to shower the kids with love. I want them to know that I love them because they're not going to trust anything that I do unless they know mm -hmm. that I care about them. Mm -hmm. And some of the kids I heard look at you as a father figure. Yes. So you've got, got a, a brood of kids, right? I do, I do. Yeah, I had a, um, this last weekend, I went out to brunch with a former student who is being deployed to Saudi Arabia. But yeah, she calls me dad and she takes me mm. out for Father's Day. Mm. That's um, a real testimony to your relationship with them. Are the other teachers in your school having similar, uh, easier time with discipline, or is that? We have a great staff at Harding. We have a phenomenal staff. I'm so <laughs> proud to have been in that community for the past 19 years. I think that the staff that mostly struggle is our newer staff, because we've had a lot of turnover over okay. the past couple of years due to the pandemic, a lot of teacher retirements mm. and a lot of teachers just moving on because of just the difficulty right. of yeah, the pandemic. So, of... but we have a large veteran group and they're really, really great. Holding down the fort. They huh? are holding down the fort <laughs> and we're holding each other down as well. Yeah, I bet, I bet the, the um, community feeling between and among the teachers is, is really important. Um, I've been reading and we all have, you have, about the fact that college isn't maybe something that everyone needs to be uh, focused on as much as we have been through the last decades. We need to think more about trade schools, the good incomes that trades bring in, et cetera, the match with people's interests. Um, how do you handle that, kind of walk the line between not discourage in college versus, you know, encouraging trade schools. How do you help people decide? I think our district is doing a really good job. They incorporated career pathways. And so not only are we, you know, obviously exposing students to college with, you know, college visits and applications, but we're also exposing them to classes where they can actually learn a trade as well. Mm, okay, so you give them experience with both both kinds of classes so that yes. they get so a sense. Yes, so in our, in our building, I know we have a criminal justice class, we have an auto shop class, so we have classes where students can learn and pursue other mm -hmm. opportunities that aren't so college focused. Mm -hmm. Now in Minneapolis, where I live, we've got the magnet schools. So kids are often choosing a magnet school based on their interests. But I'm so aware that kids change so much from year to year and every few years they might have a different goal. Um, but I think that's okay. I mean, even when I was a kid as, as well, like I wanted to 
be a professional football right. player. And then I was like, okay, at the time I was working at a pizza company, so I was like, maybe I want to pursue, pursue management that way. Mm -hmm. So I think it's okay that kids think about the things that they want to do. I think it's important that they're exposed to it so that they can yeah. find out whether yeah. or not they truly love it. Yeah. How is the graduation rate for kids at Harding right now? I don't know specifically, but I think our district as a whole is in the mid 80s. Okay, that's pretty good, isn't mm -hmm. it? For, Especially after for the pandemic, urban, yes. Urban school. Yeah. Right. Did you have a mentor that was someone that influenced you a lot in terms of what you've gone into and done? Yes, my college professor, Dr. Mm -hmm. Krieger at Concordia. When mm -hmm. I showed up on campus, I was mistakenly signed up for the wrong class, yeah. and I was scheduled in the highest math class on, in the, on campus, and that was called abstract algebra. And I remember the first day, just my eyes were wide. I did not know any of <laughs> what the, am the I verbiage. Into here? <laughs> yeah, or, or, yeah, so. Uh, he quickly figured out that I was misplaced, but I was lucky enough to take some other classes with him, all the cal calculus series. Uh, but the thing that wanted me to follow in his footsteps was the energy and passion he brought to the classroom every day. Mm. He just made math so exciting, mm. upper level math, <laughs> so mm. exciting. Wow, so that one teacher again was the turning point in your life, right? Yes, when I entered Concordia, the only majors that they had was like finance and business and teaching. And I couldn't imagine myself being in a cubicle for the next 40 years. So as I was seeing him teach and seeing the passion that he brought to the classroom every day, I said, well, this could be something that I could be good at. Mm -hmm. My big, the biggest hurdle for me though was public speaking because I hated it. Uh, but I was able to quickly, you know, overcome that. Wow, um, so interesting. We just have a few minutes left, but as you think about our schools in our country, our public schools specifically, what changes, if you could wave a magic wand, what changes would you like to see our state and our country really work toward? Mental health, I mm -hmm. think adding more mental health professionals um, into the schools, I think would, would be the, one of the biggest things that I would love to, to implement. I had a student who came to me and we've had, we have a really good relationship and she shared with me that she's been going to therapy and she's been depressed since the pandemic, so she's been on antidepressants. And she shared with me recently that she can't afford or her parents can't afford to continue to send her to therapy. Uh, mm. So I quickly intervened and brought her to a social worker in, in, in our building, but that social worker is overbooked. Yeah, I so, so is she the only social worker? No, we have we have four social workers, oh, but they're do? all by grade level. Oh, one per grade then? One per grade level, okay. yes. And so the students so are easily, in a specific yeah, grade so level, so you're talking about three to 400 students in each grade level oh gosh, need yeah. access to you right. know, mental health professional. Right. And you know, obviously that's not a great ratio, no. one to three or 400. You can't really establish a relationship Correct. easily with that many kids. Right, um, so for me, I think all, everyone, but including our, our young adults, our, our scholars, they should have access to mental health professionals. Do you think that is something that the school districts are open to adding, putting more money into that from what you know? And you're a union mm -hmm. a leader too, right, in yes. your school? I believe so, but it just comes down to funding. Right, right. Um, and do you see it as a priority or, or not enough of a priority? I know that our union is definitely pushing for more mental health professionals in our, in our, for our district. Again, it just comes down to the funds that we get from, from the state government, whether or not we can actually afford to, to get more of those supports. But when you think in terms of 300 kids in a, in a grade at your high school, just one high school, and one social worker, and some statistics I've read that are saying 50 to 60% of young teen girls 
are dealing with anxiety and depression. Um, right there, we know the, we can do the math on that, can't right. we? Yeah. Yeah, we need more. Yes. We need more for sure. Okay, so that that's uh, really important to know. Now, your, your year of being the teacher of the year for Minnesota obviously has just started. But you go to Washington D.C. and meet with the president. Is that still yes. one of the yes, I'm one of the to that. things you get to do? Yes, I'm looking forward to that. I think it's next April. Okay, almost a year then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. What else will you be doing, Mike, in terms of, of uh, or do you even know yet? Some of your I'm duties. learning. I'm learning along the way, but I think going to the legislature. Uh, will be a couple of things that I will be doing throughout the year. Um, I will also be uh, going to colleges, talking to uh, mm -hmm. prospective teachers as well. Okay. Uh, this platform will allow you to, to yeah, have more. I'm hoping to take advantage more, of it. Yeah, influence, and that's great. And I love your emphasis on mental health mm -hmm. because um, we need to not let that go any, any uh, longer than we have to in terms of dealing with it. Um, I want to thank you for coming down and um, joining me tonight. I know you've got the end of the year here. We're taping on May 17th, so it's the busiest time of the year, and then you've got the big, big uh, honor to be observing. So it's great, though, to get a chance to sit with you and I can see why you're chosen. Um, thank you so much. Very it was obvious. my honor, my honor to be here oh. with you today. Well, thank you, and good luck as you enjoy, I hope, your, your year of being an influencer and um, keep up the great work with your, your people, your kids. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for being a teacher. We need, <laughs> we need you. <laughs> thank you. I've been talking to Mike Houston, the 2023 Minnesota Teacher of the Year. Hope you've enjoyed him like I have. I'll see you next week. Until then, have a good week. <laughs>